Hello, and welcome to the Rosenbach and our In Conversation mini-series on the Federalist Papers. 230 years after the Federalist Papers were published, many of the constitutional debates raised by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay remain urgent today. This series of programs features legal experts who focus on one particular Federalist paper to show how it relates to American democracy today. We also have some items from our collection on display in the other room. There's a first edition, uh, printed edition of the Federalist Papers, and also a letter from Robert E. Lee to Winfield Scott, just as it was April, 20 April, 1861. Um, informing him of his uh, resigning from the army. And, uh, and that's kind of a little bit about what we'll hear, the, some of the issues uh, tonight uh, in our talk. To introduce tonight's speaker, please welcome the Deputy Director of Enrichment and Civic Engagement at the Free Library of Philadelphia, Andrew Nurkin. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all for being here. As Ed said, my name is Andrew Nurkin. I'm the Deputy Director for Enrichment and Civic Engagement at the Free Library of Philadelphia. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Kermit Roosevelt. When we started planning this mini-series on the Federalist Papers, we knew it would be timely. Uh, after all, there is an entire verse about the Federalist Papers in the musical Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but tonight's discussion of Federalist 46 may be urgent in particular ways, because it deals with one of the driving dynamics of American life, one that pervades nearly every major policy question of our time, the relationship between the states and the federal government. Could Madison, who claims in Federalist 46 that the new federal military would not need more than 30,000 men, have envisioned a republic of nearly 330 million people with 300 million guns? Could he have imagined state health care exchanges, the movement to decriminalize marijuana, or individual states forming a climate alliance in defiance of federal foreign policy? Could he have foreseen the ways in which the federal government would act to protect civil rights in the face of unjust state laws, or the ways in which states would be called on to act on behalf of their citizens when Congress and the executive failed to do so? Fortunately for us, Kermit Roosevelt is here with the answers. <laughs> Professor Roosevelt is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, a former Clark clerk to Justice David Souter, an award-winning author of both fiction and nonfiction books, including the 2015 novel uh, Allegiance. He is a frequent op-ed contributor whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Washington Times, Time, Newsweek, pretty much any outlet of record that you could name. Two of his law review's articles have been cited in Supreme Court decisions, his areas of research include constitutional law, the Supreme Court, civil rights, leadership, conflict of laws, Japanese American internment, and US presidential history, a subject on which he has some family knowledge. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Kermit Roosevelt back to the Roosevelt. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you to the sponsors for sponsoring this event. Thank you to the Rosenbach for having me. I'm always, always happy to be here. Um, and I'm particularly happy to be here as part of this Federalist Papers series. I think that's great. The Federalist Papers are very important. They're cited by the Supreme Court more, I think, than any other secondary source. They're cited almost as frequently as the Supreme Court cites the actual records of the Constitutional Convention. They are, though, a little bit dry. So I remember struggling through some of them in high school before I came, became a constitutional law professor. And I didn't find them quite as fascinating as I do now. And it's not the case that my students are running up to me saying, look, I was just reading Federalist 51 and I had this great idea. Um, my students have a little bit of trouble getting through them. And they're law students. But I'm going to try to make this talk interesting. Now, one way to do that would be to transport you back to 1788 and the debates over the Constitution. Will the fledgling American Union survive? Are we a nation of states? What's the state of our nation? Well, that's a line from Hamilton. I don't know if you recognize it or not. I don't, I don't know if you've seen Hamilton. If you haven't, you should. It's wonderful. Um, and Hamilton does the take you back to 1788 thing much better than I could. 
And it does, as you heard, have the Federalist Papers. It points out that Hamilton wrote the other 51. That's the line, um, which is extraordinary. Hamilton wrote a lot of the Federalist Papers. Hamilton's a great guy. But I'm actually not going to talk about a Hamilton Federalist Paper. I'm talking about 46, and Madison wrote 46. And I'm not going to try to take you back to 1788. What I'm going to talk about is the experience of reading the Federalist Papers now. And what I want to suggest, the way that I think this is interesting, is that reading the Federalist Papers is like reading science fiction. (laughs) Or actually, I'm going to say it's like being in a science fiction story. That's how exciting it is, or should be. Because the Federalist Papers, and particularly Federalist 46, can tell us something very important about America, about modern America, about who we are, and where our values come from. So I don't know if you read Federalist 46 or not. Was that your reading assignment for this? (laughs) Well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Doesn't really matter. We're going to talk about it. Um, I'm going to quote parts of it. But generally speaking, what is Federalist 46 about? It's about the relationship between the nation and the states. And basically, what Madison is trying to do in Federalist 46 is reassure the people that the states will remain the primary sovereigns in the American system. And this is really the main theme in the debates over the Constitution. The federal government that the Constitution is creating looks pretty powerful. And people are worried maybe it's going to be a tyrant. Maybe it's going to oppress people in the way that King George did. Now, many features of the Constitution that the framers wrote are designed to make that less likely. And several of the Federalist Papers are designed to allay people's fears on that score. And here Madison is saying, don't worry. First, don't worry, the federal government is not as scary and dangerous as you think it is. It's just another representative of the people. The people are the ultimate sovereigns. So the federal and state governments aren't actually opposed to each other. They're equally agents of the people. But which will receive greater trust and support? The states, Madison answers. Many considerations, he says, beyond those suggested on a former occasion, seem to place it beyond doubt that the first and most natural attachment of the people will be to the governments of their respective states. Now, why is that? Well, the state governments will employ more people. They will pay out more money. They will enact more significant regulations and be a greater presence in people's lives. And he says, members of the federal government will feel an attachment to their states. So they are unlikely to try to expand federal power at the expense of the states. But what if they did? What if the federal government does try to extend its power beyond its due limits, to take away the rights of citizens in the way that King George did? Well, says Madison, the states have the advantage in the means of defeating such encroachments. The means of opposition are powerful and at hand. If several adjoining states objected to some federal measure, their concerted action, he says, would present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. And in fact, he suggests actually all the states would unite to resist. And that would be like the revolution. Every government, he says, would espouse the common cause. A correspondence would be opened. Plans of resistance would be concerted. One spirit would animate and conduct the whole. The same combinations, in short, would result from an apprehension of the federal as was produced by the dread of a foreign yoke. And unless the projected innovations should be voluntarily renounced, unless the federal government backs down, the same appeal to a trial of force would be made in the one case as was made in the other. But of course, Madison says that wouldn't happen. What degree of madness, he asks, could ever drive the federal government to such an extremity? In the contest with Great Britain, one part of the empire was employed against the other. The more numerous part invaded the rights of the less numerous part. The attempt was unjust and unwise, but it was not in speculation absolutely chimerical. But what would be the contest in the case we are supposing? Who would be the parties? A few representatives of the people would be opposed to the people themselves. Or rather, one set of representatives would be contending against 13 sets of representatives, with the whole body of their common constituents on the side of the latter. And even if that did happen, even if the federal government and the states go to war, the states will win. Let a regular army, says Madison, fully equal to the resources of the country be formed and let it be entirely at the devotion of the federal government, still it would not be going too far to say that the state governments with the people on their side would be able to repel the danger. The US Army, he estimates, could not muster more than 25 or 30,000 men. And to these would be opposed a militia amounting to near half a million of citizens with arms in their hands, officered by men chosen from among themselves 
fighting for their common liberties, and united and conducted by governments possessing their affection and confidence. It may well be doubted whether a militia thus circumstanced could ever be conquered by such a proportion of regular troops. Those who are best acquainted with the last successful resistance of this country against the British arms will be most inclined to deny the possibility of it. The revolution shows us, that is, that the federal government will never be able to defeat the states. So, what do we think about that, reading it today? Well, the first point is things have not really worked out the way that Madison predicted. <laughs> Are people more attached to their states or to their nation? Well, there's actually some regional variation on this for reasons that perhaps you can guess. But generally speaking, I think, I talk to my law students about this, usually they agree, people feel that they are Americans first and Pennsylvanians second. For instance, people often move from state to state and they thereby change their state citizenship. They don't think that much of doing this. They think much less than they would if they moved to another country and changed their national citizenship. Madison was right that state and local governments employ more people than the federal government. This is in part because of many state and local employees in the field of education. But he was wrong about spending. The federal government spends more. The federal government spent slightly over $4 trillion. The state and local governments all combined spent slightly under $4 trillion. And a third of that state and local spending was actually federal funds given to state and local governments. And last, what about the army? Well, the standing US armed forces are about 1.2 million service members with another 800,000 reserves. Compared to that, the state militias, which remember, we're gonna outnumber the standing federal army almost 20 to one. The state militias don't really exist anymore. There is the National Guard, so you've got about 350,000 people in the National Guard, but that is actually a federal force that can be called up into federal service. The state militias, some states do still have their own defense forces, which are state units that can't be absorbed by the federal army. Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri, Texas. Texas has a Navy too, um, <laughs> but most of them don't. So this is one way that reading Federalist 46 is sort of like reading speculative science fiction from a long time ago. It's describing and predicting a world that really didn't come to pass. It's as though Madison is saying, go ahead, ratify the Constitution, don't worry about it. We're gonna have flying cars and personal <laughs> jetpacks and robot butlers. You know, it's just not the way things worked out. But here's the important thing, that is not the way people read the Federalist Papers, right? We don't look at the Federalist Papers for entertainment or to marvel at what the past thought the future would look like. We actually read the Federalist Papers to tell us how to resolve modern controversies. That is how the Supreme Court uses them, as a guide to how to understand the Constitution, which is, in a sense, how to understand who we are. And from that perspective, reading the Federalist Papers reminds me a little bit of some particular science fiction books. So a lot of this is about science fiction, I said, um, which is Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Now, I don't know if you know about this, just as I don't know if you read Federalist 46. Foundation series was not on the reading assignment for this talk. But I'm gonna summarize it briefly. Asimov's conceit was that sometimes thousands of years in the future, a field of study called psychohistory develops. And it uses psychological, psychological techniques to predict the future. The idea being individuals are unpredictable, but people in the aggregate are not. And therefore, you look at current conditions and it is possible to forecast what's gonna happen on a global or even a galactic scale. Now, the foremost practitioner of psychohistory is a man named Harry Seldon, and he runs his predictions, and he sees the current galactic empire is going to collapse. It's decadent, it's polarized, it's gonna fall apart. That's how things happen. So he enacts this plan that is going to allow a successor civilization to arise much faster than it normally would, which will reduce the human suffering that would occur during the intervening dark ages. And he leaves messages and instructions for the leaders of this civilization, which he calls the foundation, to consult at appropriate times. He predicts the problems that the foundation is going to encounter, and he tells them the solutions. Now, most people nowadays, if they know about Harry Seldon, associate him with, say, big data as a sort of speculative forerunner of modern mapping and predictive techniques, which makes sense. But another parallel 
I think, and maybe a more striking one, is with a particular way of thinking about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers. And according to this view, the framers of the Constitution were demigods. They were the Harry Seldons of their day. And they saw the path America would take, and they saw the challenges it would face, and they put the answers in the Constitution. So we don't have recorded messages from them to open at particular moments of crisis, but the answers to our current problems are there if we look hard enough, if we figure out the original understanding of these constitutional provisions, if we understand it well enough. However, here's what happens in the Foundation series. Harry Seldon's first few recordings are spot on. They resolve the problems that they're addressing. But then there's this terrible crisis. Someone from the edge of the galaxy is taking over worlds one by one. Everyone gathers to listen to the recording, to hear what Harry Seldon has told them to do, how he solved this problem. And he's talking about something totally different. And that is maybe a better description of the experience of reading the Federalist Papers now if you're reading them for guidance through a modern crisis. Because the predictions of the framers of the Constitution were accurate for a while, but history diverged from that path pretty far back. And if you're worried now that the federal government has grown too powerful or is doing too much, and plenty of people actually do worry that, and you look to the Federalist Papers for guidance, it's as though you turned on that Harry Seldon recording and got something totally irrelevant. Don't worry, right? People will consider their state citizenship primary. States will outspend the federal government. State militias will defeat the federal army. No. <laughs> Federalist 46 is just describing a world that didn't come to pass. Except that in part it did. So in one very important way, what Madison wrote about in Federalist 46 did happen, just not the way he predicted. The federal government, he said, would never fight a war against the states. That would be one government against 13. Well, it depends on how you count, right? And it depends in particular on whether you count Missouri and Kentucky. But <laughs> if you do, then you get the one versus 13 war that Madison described. The federal government versus the 13 states of the Confederacy. So the contest between federal and state authority did in fact come to pass. It's just that the federal government won. And here's the moment where reading the Federalist Papers is actually like being in a science fiction story of another sort. There's a common plot device in science fiction, and you do see this more broadly, but science fiction has some particularly good examples of it, where the hero is hunting some enemy, and it's a clone or an android replicant. It's something that looks human, but really isn't, right? It's not one of us. It's alien, it's different, it's the enemy. And the hero goes through the various trials and adventures and finally kills the enemy and examines the body only to find that it's human. And then he looks up into the camera. I'm looking at the camera. Um, and you see the realization slowly dawning in his eyes. If that's the human, then I'm the robot, right? I'm the clone, I'm the enemy. Now at this point you might be puzzled. <laughs> America has had its trials and conflicts, of course, but our basic story the way we tell it, is a story of continuity, right? We start with the noble principles of the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, endowed with inalienable rights, including liberty. And those principles are embodied in the Constitution. And with their guidance, we survive our trials and we move forward. We defeat foreign enemies, like the fascists in World War II. We defeat domestic enemies, like the Confederates in the Civil War. And we are the heirs of the signers of the Declaration and the framers of the Constitution. That is the story that we typically tell ourselves to explain who we are, right? We are the heirs of that first revolution, as John F. Kennedy put it. American history starts with the Declaration. It starts on this high note of idealism. We're trying to sustain it. We're trying to live up to the ideals of the founders and the signers. And Lincoln actually says this in the Gettysburg Address. We are a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And the Civil War, he suggests, is a war for the principles of the Declaration for the nation that the framers imagined, for a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Martin Luther King invokes the same words 100 years later in his I Have a Dream speech. He asks Americans to look back and live out the full meaning of all men are created equal. So according to this story that we tell ourselves, the framers had the right idea. We're following their wisdom. For 200 years, it's pointed the way to a better America and a more perfect union. <laughs> 
Now this is, of course, the idea that the framers were the Harry Seldons of their day, right? They got it right. We are living in the world that they designed. We are following their plan. That's the standard story of America. It's the basis, really, of our civic religion. So as the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment says, we can't have a real official national religious religion, but we sort of have a secular religion, right? We build a religion around the Constitution. And we think sometimes that it's infallible in the way that a sacred text is. Um, and so we look at the founding constitution, we're like, here's the wonderful document that has taken us continuously through all of the years and all of the trials that we have faced. Um, and that's a nice story. But it's really not true. Now, it's going to take a while to make that argument. So I'm going to have to ask you for a little bit of patience as I go through these things. But what I'm going to try to do now is to demonstrate that this standard story is inaccurate in some important ways and basically backwards in others. The principles of the Declaration are not what we think they are. They are not our modern American values of liberty and equality. They are not, I'm going to suggest, inconsistent with slavery. The Declaration is not the source of our modern American values, and neither is the Founders' Constitution, not the one described in the Federalist Papers. Their America is not our America. We are not the heirs of that first revolution. We come from somewhere else. So the first thing I want to do is look back at the Declaration of Independence and think about what its values actually are. People usually pay the most attention to the preamble of the Declaration, and that's appropriate. After the preamble, you get grievances against King George. Those come later. They're not as important. They're evidence that the founders set out, but they aren't the argument. And the Declaration is at heart an argument, an argument of political philosophy that tries to establish that the colonies are justified in declaring independence, that is, in rejecting the authority of the British Empire. And to understand the Declaration, the crucial thing is to understand how that argument works. So what does the preamble say? Well, let's start with the self-evident truths. All men are created equal. They are endowed with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are self-evident, the Declaration says, which means there's not going to be any argument in support of them. But they are the building blocks of an argument. And what that argument is, is the key point here. So remember what the Declaration is trying to do. It is trying to say, as a matter of political philosophy, the colonies have the right to take their place on the world stage as free and independent states. And that is the point of setting out these first principles. They relate to an argument that the colonies owe no duty of obedience to the British crown. This is, remember, a declaration of independence of the colonies. It is not a declaration of rights. It is not the declaration of rights of man and citizen. That's France. It's not the universal declaration of human rights. That's the United Nations. Principles about the rights that people have are really not the concern of our declaration, except to the extent that they do some particular work in this argument about independence. <coughs> so what do they do in the argument about independence? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. They both relate to claims that the British crown might make, claims that the colonists must obey for some reason. And the first one is the colonists must obey because George is their king. He was born to rule. He was given that authority by God. That's what it means when they say king by the grace of God. So rebellion against him is unjustified. In fact, it's a sin. This is the theory of the divine right of kings, one theory about where legitimate authority comes from. And in the context of the Declaration, it's actually a bit of a straw man, because by 1776, the English monarchy is no longer claiming divine authority. The idea has been attacked by Milton, by Locke, by Thomas Paine in the pamphlet entitled Common Sense. But Jefferson thinks he needs to deal with it, and he does, with this simple proposition. All men are created equal. That is, no one is born to rule. This is America. There are no kings here. And that's what I'm going to call, for short, Jefferson's equality. There are no kings. And I mean this in a very literal sense. Right? There is no such thing as a king. There is no such thing as someone who is entitled to be your ruler from birth, or from creation, or by divine fiat. But you might wonder, are there slaves? And the answer is yes, of course there are. Jefferson himself owns several hundred. Now, of course, other founders did too. And by the standards of the age, you were progressive if you freed your slaves when you died. Jefferson, of course, didn't even do that. He freed a small number of slaves on his death, and those ones were actually his children. But back to Jefferson's equality. This, I said, is the idea that there are no kings. 
It is not the idea that there are no slaves because slavery is not inconsistent with Jefferson's equality. A slave is someone who is held in bondage by force rather than by a claim of legitimate authority. This is someone who does not consent, someone who is not part of the political community. And Jefferson's equality certainly doesn't tell us that slaves simply don't exist in the way it tells us kings do not. People are born equal, but they don't have to stay that way. People might acquire authority over each other. That, of course, is what a lot of the Declaration is about, how authority is acquired. People might enslave each other. And nothing in the idea of being born equal says that that can't happen, and not even so much that it shouldn't happen, although you could make an argument about that. But here's another point where it's interesting to compare the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which says people are born and remain free. Our Declaration doesn't say that. Now, Jefferson does reject the idea that some people can say to others, by your birth you are a slave, and therefore I'm entitled to demand your obedience. But he doesn't reject the idea that some people can say, for instance, by your birth you are inferior, and it is in your best interest to be my slave. I give you Christianity. I give you civilization. This was actually a common justification for slavery at the time. Right? This is an argument people were, in fact, making in support of slavery, unlike you're a slave from birth. And this argument actually fits pretty well with Jefferson's views. Jefferson's views were complicated. He seemed to believe both that slavery shouldn't have been introduced and also that given that it had been introduced, the best thing to do was keep it going. Because he believed that blacks were inferior, that slaves, if freed, probably couldn't survive on their own. And his concept of equality is consistent with this. Right? It's very limited. It's not the claim that people are equal in their abilities. It is not a moral principle about equal treatment by the government. It's a certain political idea of equality right, relating to the ability of some people to demand obedience from others. And it's actually a pre-political equality in that it's equality as a starting point. It's equality in the state of nature, which is this hypothetical situation that exists before a society or a government is formed. And nothing in this idea says that people will end up equal or free. Nothing says government should treat them equally or try to make them equal. Our declaration is about when legitimate authority can be rejected. And in order to do that, it has to tell you how legitimate authority is or isn't required. And it's not acquired by birth. That is the full meaning of all men are created equal, as far as the declaration is concerned. Exactly the same thing is true of the principle that people have inalienable rights, including liberty. This is also the rebuttal of a claim that the British crown might make. This time, it's the claim of an indissoluble social contract. So this claim would be, yes, sure, people start out equal. They start out with natural rights. But when they form a society, they surrender those rights irrevocably to the government. So the colonists would say, King George, you violated our liberty. King George would say, you can't respond. Sorry, King George would respond, you can't complain that I'm violating your liberty because you gave up your liberty in exchange for my protection, in exchange for me keeping the peace. And this was, at the time, a recognized version of social contract theory. It's the version of Thomas Hobbes rather than John Locke. But the Declaration takes Locke's position. It rejects this. And it says to George, you're wrong. The colonists didn't surrender their liberty. They couldn't have because that right is inalienable. So Jefferson is being precise here. He understands the meaning of his terms. The point of saying that something is inalienable is you can't give it up. If you look at the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is one of the sources that Jefferson drew on in drafting the Declaration of Independence, you can actually see the argument spelled out in a little bit more detail. Because the Virginia Declaration says people are born with inalienable rights of which they cannot by any compact divest themselves or their posterity. And then we get to the actual heart of the Declaration, the real fundamental principle. People create governments to secure their inalienable rights. And when the government threatens those rights, people can alter or abolish their government. The right of rebellion. If the government threatens the rights that it's supposed to protect, then you can change it. That is the heart of the Declaration. Right? This is what it's concerned with. Rebellion. When is it justified? Now, this too, maybe you would think, has some relevance to the slave. Right? Are the colonial governments protecting the rights of the slaves? Well, of course not. But they don't claim to. And they weren't created by the slaves. And they don't hold their authority through the consent of the slaves. So here is another fundamental point about the Declaration. It's about the relationship between members of a political community. 
the relationship between the governors and the governed. Legitimate authority, the Declaration says, is based on the consent of the governed. The argument of the Declaration is about when that consent can be withdrawn. Slaves, as I said, never consented. They are held in bondage by force. They are outsiders. They are hereditary, perpetual outsiders to the American community. That is what the Supreme Court will say in the Dred Scott decision. It says descendants of slaves can never become citizens of the United States. They can never be members of the political community. Which means the argument that the Declaration makes about when a legitimate government can be abolished or when consent can be withdrawn about this relationship between the governors and the governed really has nothing to say about the situation of slaves. So what have I said so far? The principles of the Declaration, I have said, are not broad moral principles. They're actually pretty narrow political principles. They are not the ideals that we now think of as fundamental to our identity as Americans. They are not our modern values of liberty and equality. They are not actually even inconsistent with slavery. But what about the Founders' Constitution? Is that a statement of our principles as Americans? Is that the values that we hold dear? Well, no, for two reasons. The second reason, and this is something that uh, maybe I'll talk more about later, is that the Founders' Constitution is not our Constitution. There is no line from the Declaration through that Constitution to us. We are not the heirs of that first revolution. We come from somewhere else. But that point is a little bit farther down the road. And the main thing I want to focus on now is the content of the Founders' Constitution. So it's relatively well accepted among constitutional law professors that even if you suppose the Declaration contains broad moral principles of liberty and equality, right? and there I've said I don't think it does. I'm a little bit of an outlier on that. Right? Most people think it does. Um, but even if you accept that, now I'm in the consensus view when I say those principles did not make it into the Founders Constitution. The Founders Constitution contains very few strong statements of principles or values. Now we often talk about it as if it does. We say the Constitution tells us what it means to be an American. But if you look at the document that was written in 1787, there are basically no undiluted principles there. If there's an overarching theme of the 1787 Constitution, it's compromise. There's compromise between big states and small states. That's what gives you the two houses of Congress, one with representatives determined by population and one with senators allotted two to each state. There's compromise between free states and slave states. That's the three-fifths compromise which gives states some extra representatives based on members of their population that they enslave. And what about the values of liberty and equality? Well, equality is hardly there at all. And when it is, it's mostly a right of states. States are entitled to equal representation in the Senate, for instance. Liberty does a little bit better. There's the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, for instance. But like all of the original Bill of Rights, these rights are available only against the federal government. The states can basically do what they want to their own citizens and to their slaves. So another thing about the Founders' Constitution and its relation to liberty and equality is it's pro-slavery. There's the Fugitive Slave Clause, of course, which says that slaves who escape to a free state must be returned. There's a provision that protects the international slave trade until 1808. And maybe more important, there's the Three-Fifths Compromise, which enhances the power of slaveholding states in the federal government. It gives them more representatives in Congress, and it thereby gives them more votes in the Electoral College. So four of our first five presidents come from the slave state of Virginia. And one of them, Thomas Jefferson, would actually have lost the election of 1800 to John Adams of Massachusetts, if not for the Three-Fifths Compromise. So what have I said now? Well, being an American nowadays means being committed to certain values, most notably maybe the values of liberty and equality. And we think of these as values that the government should observe and promote in the sense that people should be free. People should be equal. People are entitled to complain if the government infringes on their liberty or treats them unequally. But you really don't find those values by looking back to the Declaration and the Founders' Constitution. They just aren't there. So there's one problem with the standard story. It's imposing onto the past a set of values that didn't really exist. Now, if you want to look back to the Declaration and the Founders' Constitution and tell a story about an American identity that was born then and has endured through the years, you can do it. But it's not a very happy story. It's a story about putting unity ahead of justice, ahead of equality. It's a story about the shadow of slavery hanging over the nation, about that poison working its way through the body politic. 
That story starts with the Declaration, which brings together the free states and the slave states. America is going to be a union. It has to be to achieve independence. The states act separately. They cannot defeat the British Empire. But that means the free and the slave states have to join together. So although some founders oppose slavery, the Declaration says very little about it. Jefferson's first draft did say something. It blamed King George for the existence of slavery in America, and then it also blamed him for inciting slave rebellions. Now, most people think that's inconsistent. I think that's Jefferson's actual view. Shouldn't have had slavery, but now that we have it, got to maintain it. Um, in the end, though, the final draft took out the attack on slavery itself, left in the complaint that King George was encouraging slaves to rebel. So even if the Declaration announces principles that are inconsistent with slavery, and like I said, I don't think it does, it quite deliberately doesn't criticize the practice. Accepting slavery is the price of independence. And it's the price of union. So after the Revolution, we get the Articles of Confederation, which are basically like a treaty among independent states. The people who draft the Articles of Confederation remember the tyranny of the British. They set out to create a central government that is too weak to become a tyrant. And they succeed in that. They succeed brilliantly. But of course, the central government they create is also too weak to govern effectively. It can't keep the states in line. So we need a new government. That's what the Founders' Constitution gives us. But once again, we have to get the free and slave states together. If we can't form a single nation, the European powers may pick off the individual states one by one. France and Spain and England will come in and dismember the United States. So the Founders' Constitution accepts slavery. It protects it in the ways that I mentioned before. It rewards slave states with extra power in the federal government. Now, one of the things that I always do with my constitutional law students is I take the first few weeks to read through the Founders' Constitution, clause by clause. And we discuss just about every sentence going up through the Bill of Rights, because the Bill of Rights is basically part of the Founders' Constitution. And then I say, what do you think? Is this a glorious statement of American principles that has served us well for over 200 years? Or is it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell? <laughs> yes. And they laugh, right? Everyone always laughs. And then I'm like, no, it's supposed to be scary. But actually, you're supposed to laugh. Um, they laugh because they're surprised, because they've been taught the standard story about how wonderful and successful the Constitution has been. And most of them have not heard the phrase covenant with death and agreement with hell. It comes from the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. And of those two descriptions, honestly, I think Garrison's is closer. Because the Founders' Constitution is a compromise. It's a deal. You get an American nation, but you must accept slavery. And that is a bargain with evil. That is a deal with the devil. And like most deals with the devil, it doesn't work out very well. Because what happens? Well, the Founders' Constitution is pro-slavery, I said, but it doesn't entrench slavery forever. The protection of the international slave trade, for instance, explicitly expires in 1808. The issue of slavery basically just gets pushed down the road. And that road leads to the battlefields of the Civil War. The Civil War happened because the Founders' Constitution compromised and did not resolve the issue of slavery. And I mean that first in a political sense. The Constitution could have taken a position one way or the other. It could have said, slavery forever. And maybe that Constitution would have been ratified. Or it could have said, slavery will end. Not immediately. That constitution certainly wouldn't have been ratified. But in some number of years, that might have been acceptable. But it was easier to say nothing about it. And that's what the founders did. The constitution is structured to support slavery. In the early years, the slave states controlled the national government. Up until 1860, there are only two presidents, the Adamses from Massachusetts, who opposed slavery. But then things change. And in a way that the founders actually didn't expect. The North grows in population, even with the Three-Fifths Compromise, which, remember, increases the federal representation of slave states. The free states start exceeding the slave states in the House of Representatives and in the Electoral College. So the North is increasingly controlling the federal government and the presidency. In 1856, the South votes for James Buchanan, and he becomes president, defeating the anti-slavery John Fremont. In 1860, the South votes for John Breckinridge, but he doesn't win. Abraham Lincoln wins. And Abraham Lincoln, to an extent that is impossible to overstate, is not the Southern choice. 
in 10 of the 11 states, this is excluding Missouri and Kentucky, in 10 of the 11 states that are going to secede, Lincoln gets zero votes, zero popular votes. Not a single person votes for Abraham Lincoln. Now, that's because he wasn't on the ballot. Um, and he wasn't on the ballot because to put someone on the ballot, you would have had to endure the opprobrium and possible violence of your friends and neighbors in these states. Um, in the 11th, Virginia, he is on the ballot. He gets 1.1% of the popular vote. So the South sees the national government falling into the hands of anti-slavery forces. They fear the national government is going to end slavery, and they secede. So the Civil War comes about in part because of this political failure in the Founders' Constitution. But you could also see it as a consequence of a moral failure, a consequence of the acceptance of slavery, of that deal with the devil. And Abraham Lincoln actually did understand it that way. He said the Civil War is a judgment upon us that will persist until every drop of blood drawn with the lash will be paid by another drawn with the sword. Now, after the Civil War, we face a great task. What is it? You might say, oh, it's achieving racial justice and true equality. And for a while, during Reconstruction, about which I will say more later, that did seem to be what the nation was doing. But pretty quickly, the national mission changed. It changed back to what it was with the Declaration, with the Constitution. It changed back to unity. Bring the North and South together. Heal the wounds of the Civil War. And how do we do that? In the same way that the Declaration and the Constitution did, by sacrificing racial justice. So with the Compromise of 1877, federal troops withdraw from the South. The black and integrated governments that were set up are overthrown by force. Southern whites take back control. They call this the redemption of the South. And what it means is that the promises of Reconstruction go unfulfilled for about 100 years. And there is a version of our standard story that focuses on this, that takes redemption as the founding moment of America, as the birth of the nation. There's a movie about the Civil War and its aftermath, which follows two families, one from the North, one from the South. They fight on opposite sides of the Civil War, but they're both Americans. And when the war is over, the reunion of the nation is symbolized by marriages between these families, so that the bonds of matrimony knit up the wounds of war. Now, this movie is, you might have guessed, Birth of a Nation from 1915. And it really is about the birth of the American nation. It's trying to tell us founding America broke apart. It broke into two more or less equally legitimate sides, but then it came back together in the moment of redemption. And now we can all go forward happily together because in the end, we're all Americans. So Birth of a Nation comes out in 1915. It's controversial then, but it's very popular, uh, including with President Woodrow Wilson, who's the first Southerner to hold the presidency since the Civil War. If you watch it nowadays, I think most people would agree, though, it's pretty horrifying. So it's rising action the part of the movie where tensions are growing and things are getting worse. Rising action is all about the oppression of Reconstruction with the carpetbaggers and the scalawags and the corrupt and depraved freedmen. The climax of the movie is a battle in which the Ku Klux Klan defeats the integrated militia and police force that is the legitimate government of the South Carolina town where the movie is set. And the falling action, the bit that shows you everything will be all right, is the day after that battle when the town holds new elections the freed slaves turn out to vote, and they're met by armed Klansmen standing in front of the polling booths. And they turn around and go home. And the audience is like, ah, what a relief. And the resolution, as I said, is the weddings, which reaffirm that the nation can go forward as one, not so much because we're all American, but because we're all white. And that is actually the dominant story from maybe 1915 to about 1980, when scholars begin to reassess Reconstruction. And they do that in part in response to other changes that make it harder to see redemption as our founding moment. Like, of course, the Civil Rights Movement, which comes along in the mid 20th century, and the Warren Court. And this era, interestingly, is often called the Second Reconstruction. So Congress enacts Civil Rights Acts, prohibiting racial discrimination in various contexts. The Supreme Court issues decisions like Brown v. Board of Education, banning segregation in public schools, loving against Virginia, striking down bans on interracial marriage. But this second reconstruction, like the first, is divisive. The 1960s and 70s are a tumultuous period. People feel that their traditional way of life is under attack, that the America they understand, the America they see when they look back, is being taken from them. The Republican Party campaigns against the Supreme Court 
Ronald Reagan talks about welfare queens, about strapping young bucks using food stamps to buy T-bone steaks. He says the Voting Rights Act was a humiliation of the South. He kicks off his 1980 presidential campaign by giving a speech praising states' rights in Philadelphia, but not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where the Constitution was drafted. Philadelphia, Mississippi, perhaps most notable for the murder of civil rights workers 16 years earlier. Now, Reagan's presidency is notable because it brings so many people together. He wins these crushing electoral victories over Carter and Mondale. But it kind of follows the pattern set in the Declaration and repeated thereafter, which is that it brings the nation together by pushing aside issues of racial inequality. So the pattern repeats itself. Now, I think it's fading. And if you want to tell a story of racial progress, you can tell it that way. But if you look back to the Declaration and the founding for the basic theme of the American story, it is not liberty. It is not equality. It is purchasing unity at the price of racial justice. And if you listen closely, you can still hear that theme. You can hear it, for instance, in the arguments that what the Democratic Party needs to do is set aside identity politics and recapture those working class white voters. But the main point that I want to make here is just if you look back with clear eyes, the story of America is not so much this burst of idealism that casts its light into the present day. It's more a primal sin. It's more a betrayal that echoes down the ages. And our standard story tries to put a happy gloss on that, but it's not very accurate. And the more accurate it gets, the closer it gets to birth of a nation, which is less happy by modern lights. Now, there's probably a question still in your mind, which is what does this have to do with me being the robot? <laughs> right? We got away from that. Well, what I have told you so far is that our American values don't come from the Declaration and the Founders' Constitution. So where do they come from? James Madison, I was suggesting, is no Harry Seldon. But Abraham Lincoln maybe is. So in the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln says some things about the past that I've suggested are not quite right. Founding America is not really dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Right? That's the beginning of an argument about independence. It's not the end of government. It's not a goal government should pursue. But then he says something about the future that's pretty amazing. He says, this nation shall have a new birth of freedom. And it does. The Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, give us a new set of founding principles. Now, the 13th Amendment, of course, ends slavery. 14th Amendment does a number of things. First thing it does is to reverse the Dred Scott decision. There will be, the first sentence of the 14th Amendment says, no perpetual outsiders. There will be no hereditary exclusion from our political community. If you are born here, you're a citizen. You are one of us. So birthright citizenship opens up the political community in a way that the Declaration never contemplated. And that according to the Supreme Court, the pre-Civil War Constitution forbid. Then the 14th Amendment goes on to give people rights. It gives them rights to equality, rights to liberty, rights against state governments, which they didn't have before. And it gives the federal government more power. It turns the Founders' Constitution upside down. The Founders thought the federal government was a threat to liberty. They thought the states would protect it. The Reconstruction Congress thinks states threaten liberty. The federal government will protect it. They think the federal government, representing a national people, is the more true representative of America. And that is the government that Lincoln is talking about, of the people, by the people, for the people, the federal government, for the national people. And those values in the 14th Amendment, those are our modern American values. That is Lincoln's equality, not Jefferson's. So we change things dramatically after the Civil War. I like to say, I'm going to suggest later, that the Civil War is actually the second American Revolution. And in that second American Revolution, the rebels lost. But in an important sense, the revolutionaries won. Now, here's what I mean by that. You can think of two different kinds of revolutions. One is a regime change revolution, where people say the existing system is unjust, and we're going to change it. That is the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. Second kind of revolution is a status quo revolution, where people say the existing political system is fine, but we are being denied the rights that we are entitled to under it. And that is the first American revolution. The colonist complaints against King George are basically, you have denied us our rights as Englishmen. Someone said the colonists were never more English than when they rebelled. And the second American revolution is actually the same. So the Southerners are insisting on their right to own slaves, which they think is their due under the bargain they signed, the Constitution. The Union, at the beginning of the war, is also fighting for the status quo. 
They interpret the Constitution as not allowing secession. I think probably that's wrong. Um, but in any case, they are trying to maintain the status quo ante. And this is why Lincoln famously said, if I could preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would. And if I could preserve the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do that. But then things change. And you can see this very interestingly in Lincoln's speeches. He stops talking so much about union. He starts talking more about the nation, the nation as a singular noun. Framers' Constitution, by the way, treats the United States as a plural noun, a collection of states. Lincoln says there is this nation, it's a singular thing, and it will have a new birth of freedom. We are going to change the status quo. The existing regime is unjust. And at this point, Jefferson Davis is leading a rebellion, but Lincoln is leading a revolution. And he doesn't live to see it come to fruition, but it does. Not importantly through the ordinary amendment process of Article 5. Right? We tell ourselves this, we like continuity, but if you look at the circumstances of the enactment of the 14th Amendment, it's not really Article 5, it's more a combination of pseudo-legal coercion and frank military force. The South is under military control. The Reconstruction Congress dissolves Southern legislatures. It refuses to readmit Southern members of Congress until they ratify the 14th Amendment. So this is a rupture in our history. This is a break with the established order that is every bit as significant, maybe more significant, as the revolution. And it is this second American revolution that gives us our American values. Now, Reconstruction, it's common among constitutional law professors to call this the second founding. Um, and I could actually make another Asimov parallel here, because Harry Seldon actually creates two foundations, and it's the second foundation that ultimately succeeds. But I still haven't gotten to my ultimate point, which is this. One version of our standard story says redemption is the birth of our nation, and that is not accepted so much anymore. But even the people who say, oh yes, Reconstruction is the second founding, they still go on to tell a story of continuity. They say the Reconstruction Amendments fulfill the promise of the Declaration. We are the heirs of that first revolution. <clears throat> and that is what I want to think about now. And what I want to tell you about it is it's wrong. Right? We are not the heirs of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. The heirs of the signers of the Declaration of Independence are the Southern secessionists. Now, you don't hear this all that much, but the evidence is there. The Southern states overwhelmingly invoked the Declaration of Independence in their secession letters. And they were right to. The heart of the Declaration, I have said to you, is not a moral principle like liberty or equality. It is a political theory that people form governments to protect certain rights. And if the government threatens those rights, the people can rebel. So the Southern states joined the Revolution. Later, they joined the Union to protect some rights that they valued. High on that list, in both cases, was the right to own slaves. They might have feared reasonably that the British would take that right away. Abolition is progressing through the British Empire. When they feared that the federal government would take it away, they left the Union just as they had left the Empire. And in that sense, the Civil War is the second American Revolution. And of course, the rebels won the first war. They lost the second. But it's important to see the similarities here. These are both wars fought in the name of the Declaration of Independence, under the political theory that people form governments to protect rights and can rebel if the governments threaten those rights. And in both cases, the right to own slaves is definitely one of the rights on people's minds. So the Declaration of Independence, I say, is on the side of the South. What about the Founders' Constitution? Well, this is a little bit harder to see, but the answer, again, is probably the South. What is supposed to happen? when the states fear the federal government and take arms to fight against it. Who is supposed to win? In the minds of the founders, the answer is pretty clear. Right? The founders think a distant general government might become a threat to liberty. It might start to oppress its citizens. That's what King George did. And when that happens, the states stand up to defend the rights of their citizens. That's what the state militias did, fighting off the redcoats. That war, the Revolutionary War, is the model that's built into the Founders' Constitution. That is what the Second Amendment is about. The well-regulated militia is supposed to protect the security of free states by fighting off the federal army. That is what Federalist 46 is telling us. So along comes the Second American Revolution. The states stand up for the rights of their citizens. The states are supposed to win. According to the vision of the Founders' Constitution, the South is supposed to win the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln did a lot of remarkable things. But one of the most remarkable, I think, is this sort of magic trick where he makes people think that he is the one fighting for the Declaration and the Founders' Constitution and the nation they envisioned, when in fact he is against them. 
Right? If you draw a line from the Declaration of Independence through the Founders' Constitution, it doesn't go to us, it goes to the rebel South, and it stops there. We are not the heirs of the First Revolution. We are not the heirs of the Founders. We are the heirs of the people who rejected the theory of the Declaration, who defeated it by force of arms. So when you look down at the corpse of the Confederacy, assuming it's dead, which is debatable, but when you do that, you are not seeing the deviant outsider that was properly vanquished by the principles of the Declaration. You are seeing the body of founding America. You are seeing the dead body, the central principle of the Declaration of Independence. You're seeing the death of the Founders' Constitution. And that is what you see so vividly in Federalist 46. James Madison, who of course is from Virginia, is describing the Civil War and telling us, don't worry, the South will win. So from the perspective of the Declaration and the Founders' Constitution and Federalist 46, we are the robot. We are the bad guys. Except, of course, there's another twist, which is the bad guys, the national government, turned out to be good. The Reconstruction Constitution is better than the Founding Constitution. Lincoln's equality is better than Jefferson's equality. And to give Madison credit, he kind of did see this. Towards the end of Federalist 46, he says that if by some chance the federal government does assume ascendancy over the states, there can be only one reason. If therefore, has been elsewhere, as has been elsewhere remarked, the people should in future become more partial to the federal than to the state governments, the change can only result from such manifest and irresistible proofs of a better administration as will overcome all their antecedent propensities. And that, I think, was a valid prediction. Madison got that right. We are not founding America. We are Reconstruction America. We are not the heirs of the signers of the Declaration. We are the heirs of the people who defeated them in battle. We have a greater attachment to the federal government and a lesser one to the states. But that is because the national side was ultimately the side of freedom, of equality, of justice. And that is the America that we have now, if we can keep it. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, questions. <coughs> yes? Was Federalist number 46 actually cited in advance of the Civil War uh, as part of the Southern propaganda? Gosh, that's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what they would have said about Federalist 46. I mean, the, the point that I try to make is they really did rely on the Declaration of Independence. They understood the Declaration of Independence as justifying secession when the government starts threatening the rights it's supposed to protect. Did they actually say something about Federalist 46? Well, as possibly you guessed from this talk, uh, Federalist 46 isn't really my central concern. I'm, <laughs> I'm more interested in science fiction. No, I'm more interested in like American identity and where it comes from. Um, Although Federalist 46 provides a fascinating window into that through the works of Isaac Asimov. But, um, so the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You didn't mention whether the uh, founders' notions about the future of slavery were thwarted by the development of cotton in the South. I wonder if you could talk about that. Uh, wow, right. So uh, what did the founders think? I mean, possibly the founders did think that slavery was on a path to extinction and that um, you know, the invention of the cotton gin threw that off. And also possibly the founders thought that the North would never exceed the South in population. They didn't foresee industrialization and the rising population of the northern states. So they also didn't foresee the free states gaining control of the federal government. At the time of the founding, it's pretty clear the slave states control the federal government. Right? That's why four of the first five presidents are from Virginia. So there were a bunch of things they didn't foresee. And maybe, I mean, I, haven't, I honestly hadn't thought of this before, but maybe they thought the South will remain in control, slavery will die out as it becomes economically less viable, and that's the way things will work out. 
maybe they did have a plan. Maybe they weren't just kicking the can down the road. I don't know. Um, if that was what they thought, they were wrong. <laughs> Yeah. Um, was William Seward involved in writing the Reconstruction? And uh, to, to what extent do we owe our national identity to Seward? To Seward? Well, um, Alaskans are very partial to Seward, right? Alaskans owe their national identity to Seward? Um, what a he great question. He knew Frederick Douglass extremely well. Um, yeah, I don't he know. So led this revolution. Yeah. I think Seward is an underappreciated great American. Yes. I mean, usually people credit John Bingham, Congressman John Bingham, as, as the primary author of the 14th Amendment. And then there's a lot of debate about whether Bingham had any idea what he was saying. Because for a long time, um, and this, you know, this is part of the era in which scholars are like, Reconstruction was a terrible mistake and oppressive. They also said John Bingham had no idea what he was doing and didn't have any coherent political theory. And it's absurd to think that the 14th Amendment was supposed to give people rights against the states, that it was supposed to let them assert the Bill of Rights against the states, which is the position the Supreme Court eventually comes around to. Um, but I think that like William Seward, John Bingham has been underappreciated. And actually, well, so this is another thing that I do with my students, which is very interesting. I think. Because I said, I said before, um, one reason why our standard story is wrong is that the Founders' Constitution is not our Constitution. And that's really true to an extent that I think people don't appreciate. So one of the things that I do with my students is I say, give me a big important constitutional case that you know, shows the Supreme Court in action doing what it should be doing and our constitutional rights being protected and it's big successful Supreme Court decision. Um, and then sometimes to make it easier but a little bit trickier, I'll be like, give me a First Amendment case about free speech. Or give me a Fourth Amendment case about unreasonable searches and seizures. Or a Sixth Amendment case about the right to counsel. And my students, they're law students, they can come up with a lot of these cases. The thing that they always do is they give me almost exclusively 14th Amendment cases. Even when I ask for a First Amendment case, they're like, New York Times v. Sullivan. No, that's a 14th Amendment case. And if you ask for a Sixth Amendment case, they'll be like, Gideon v. Wainwright. And if you ask for a Fifth Amendment case about compelled self-incrimination, right? Miranda v. Arizona, of course. No, that's a 14th Amendment case. All of those cases, I say to them, and I have like a chart with some cases on one side and like one or two cases on the other, because people will always say Marbury v. Madison. But Almost all of the cases are actually 14th Amendment cases. They are actually Reconstruction Constitution cases. They could not have been decided this way under the Founders Constitution. And the point of that is the Constitution that we live under, the Constitution we think of as important, the Constitution that gives us the rights that we appreciate and celebrate in cases like Brown v. Board of Education, right? That's like the biggest constitutional case. All of those are Reconstruction cases. And yet, do we know the architects of the Reconstruction Constitution? No, right? The other thing to do, the other thing to put up on the board is the people associated with the founding, right? Can you name one of the authors of the Constitution? Do you know the people who were at the Constitutional Convention? Well, given Hamilton, now they know. <laughs> but even before that, like people know Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton, Jefferson wasn't there, but Washington. We know the founding. We venerate the founding. We don't venerate Reconstruction. People don't know William Seward, underappreciated great American, or John Bingham. Um, they don't know the people who wrote the constitutional provisions that are actually the ones being enforced in these cases that are so central to our understanding of the Constitution. Let's do one more. Uh, I just had a uh, yeah. comment. It's not often that I hear a speaker that makes me completely change my <laughs> you really, I wish you were my professor. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That's, that's awfully kind. One more, yeah. I've heard it said that if the, instead of uh, Fort Sumter, if the South had petitioned to the Supreme Court in 1860 uh, and said, we want to secede and we think we have the right to secede under the 
Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, that, uh, that they would have won that and would have created a big problem for Lincoln. Do you have a view of that? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because I did want to say this. I don't know what the Supreme Court would have done, although like that's pretty much the Dred Scott Court. Um, they might well, well, I mean, so Dred Scott is actually an attempt to preserve the union. It's like a pro-slavery decision, but it's trying to preserve the union. So man, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Supreme Court would have said yes. But I did want to say why I think the answer to that is yes. So the Constitution doesn't say anything about secession. The Articles of Confederation, which preceded the Constitution, sort of did. They said, this union shall be perpetual. So on the one hand, you could say, well, a Constitution doesn't say anything. It's sort of like a treaty. If people think the other states are violating the treaty, they can withdraw. That was one of the Southern arguments. The counter argument is, well, the Constitution says we're forming a more perfect union. And the Articles of Confederation are perpetual. So this is even more binding. Of course, you can't secede. But what I think resolves this is the Declaration of Independence. So what does the Constitution think about the Declaration of Independence? Does it still believe that if your political system isn't working out, you can change it? And the answer to that, I think, has to be yes for this reason. How do we get from the Articles of Confederation to the US Constitution? Well, the US Constitution says it will become effective upon the ratification by nine states. The Articles of Confederation say any changes must be approved unanimously. So we get from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution by violating the Articles of Confederation. It's illegitimate. It's, in some ways, an overthrow of the existing political order. Um, is there any way in which we can say it's legitimate? Well, yes, the Declaration of Independence. The point being, the Articles of Confederation were a political system created to do certain things, and they weren't working. Therefore, we can ditch them and start over. But by the same token, if that's what legitimizes the Constitution, and I think it is, um, then the southern states can say, our political system is not working. We're going to start over. So I actually believe secession was permissible. Um, under the best understanding of the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution and the relationship between those. Now, actually, a lot of the constitutional problems that Lincoln encountered would have gone away if instead of saying, we're still one nation, he had said, congratulations, Confederate States of America. You're your own nation, and now we're going to conquer you. <laughs> In some ways, that would have made things a lot easier.